Monday, um, the <coughs> lecture will be in this, um, no, it will be in the Pine Room <coughs> next Monday. The Pine Room, not Pioneer Room. And it will be uh, Mr. Weinweaver from the ISU Library on the uses of the thesaurus and information retrieval, which should be rather interesting and a little different lecture. Today I'm very happy to <coughs> have Dr. Marguerite Streggs, who's assistant dean of the College of Home Economics, but also chairman of the University Committee on Women, <coughs> Status of Women, and she will lecture on that subject, I imagine, rather authoritatively. Thank you. <laughs> I can't resist a play on words, you know. I, I imagine rather authoritatively uh, anyone who would attempt to talk on the status of women would have to have a rather strong imagination to think they were an authority, maybe. <laughs> but um, I am real pleased to get to um, talk with you today about status of women. Some of you may be expecting a report from the University Committee on Women. I'm not sure. That is not what this is going to be today. I will um, tell, mention, however, that the, um, Dr. Christensen, our Vice President for Academic Affairs, did appoint a University Committee on Women in January, and this is composed of 20 people here representing an attempt at uh, the com complete range of kinds of responsibilities of people here at Iowa State. Um, I believe there are four men on the committee and 16 women. Anyway, 20 people, something like this. And this committee has divided into four subgroups because after we got to looking at what we thought needed to be studied here as a basis for making recommendations to Dr. Christensen uh, representing the university for anything that needs to be done to improve status of women at Iowa State University. We started looking what do we need to study and we decided that the questions that needed to be answered could be kind of grouped in relation to, in general, kinds of responsibilities. And so there is a subcommittee looking at academic faculty and a variety of kinds of questions in relation to this, a subcommittee that's looking at non-academic faculty situations, then one that deals with students, undergraduate, and graduate, and there are, let's see, is it three students or four, Anne, <laughs> on the committee? But there are un two undergraduate students, I believe, and two graduate students on the committee, all women. Um, and then that's three. Then the fourth subcommittee is looking at the university community, and here we're thinking of more the citizenship, <laughs> civic <laughs> idea of leadership responsibilities in the university as a community. This would be uh, major committee responsibilities, uh, administrative kinds of responsibilities, and so on. To what extent are women uh, involved and what needs to be done to improve the situation, and by improving, I don't necessarily mean anything in particular. I don't necessarily mean more women, although if that's what's needed, this would be what we would recommend. At first, we were trying to reach a uh, deadline of being ready to make some recommendations to the university by July 1, but we found that we could not meet that deadline. And so now we're aiming at having our information together and uh, 
analyzed and hopefully make a recommendation to doc a set of recommendations to dr christensen by some time in the fall quarter now that i'm sure seems slow but we are attempting to be thorough and if you wish to ask questions later i'll certainly attempt to uh, respond all of us in this room uh, have a lot at stake really in terms of what is happening in relation to women and this involves men <laughs> in the United States and there certainly is a national awareness this does not mean every individual as all of us know is uh, in sympathy with or even aware of need for change in terms of roles and I think that's plural <laughs> of men and women in our society I have had several opportunities in relation to this um, in October 1963 uh, our governor at that time was Harold Hughes and um, a governor's commission on status of women was appointed and I had the privilege of serving as chairman. That really grew out of the fact that I am in home economics, education, I mean, that's my area of specialization within home economics, and in vocational education. And the American Vocational Association had been asked to make a recommendation for someone to serve on a planning committee for a state conference dealing with problems of employed women. That was in January of 63. Out of that conference really came the recommendation for a commission and you know you happen to be at a spot <laughs> and you're asked to serve in a certain capacity and that's really the way it happened. I think um, this is just a little aside but I shall never forget the dates are the events that occurred in association with the first meeting of the Governor's Commission on Status of Women that I was involved in and the last meeting that I was involved in. Now since that time there's, there is an Iowa Commission appointed by Governor Ray and Mrs. Betty Durden of Des Moines is chairman. Uh, at least two people from this campus are on that committee, Ed Lewis in psychology and Helen LeBaron Hilton, Dean of Home Economics, are both members at the present time. Maybe there are others, I'm not sure. Those two events, our first meeting was a Saturday late in November 1963. President Kennedy had appointed a President's Commission on Status of Women and it had made its report the same day that Governor Hughes appointed the Iowa Commission. Saturday at noon we adjourned for lunch and during the lunch hour we learned of the um, assassination of President Kennedy. Um, our last meeting was in association with a state leadership meeting held on this campus on a Friday in early June of 1968 and we were meeting as a commission the following Saturday morning and it was that Friday evening that Robert Kennedy was shot. You know this this seems so strange but those were the beginning and ending dates of my functioning on the Governor's Commission on Status of Women. The just a little bit of history uh, Helen LeBaron Hilton recently had an article in the Journal of Home Economics where she was tracing a bit of history. This is kind of in conjunction with our centennial of home economics here at Iowa State. And looking back at history has helped to make some of us aware that actually the first phase of the feminist movement, the suffrage movement, movement 
the um, struggle for women's rights in relation to the ballot came about at the same time in history that the new field of home economics was taking form. And they were really both efforts, I do not mean they were deliberately planned together, but they happened at the same time and in some ways were in response to some the same kinds of things uh, that were happening in society. Really both related to our move toward equalitarianism or egalitarianism. Uh, the look in our, in our centennial effort has um, introduced some of us again to people who were graduates here at Iowa State. For example, Carrie Lane Chapman Catt, who was the only woman in the Iowa State University graduating class of 1880, who was very active in the women's suffrage movement and the uh, bringing about of the 19th Amendment in 1920 and organized the League of Women Voters. If any of you, this is facetious, <laughs> but if any of you have been to some special occasion where they had a beautiful lace tablecloth <laughs> over in uh, McKay Hall, this is probably the, cherry, the Carrie Chapman cat cloth that was a gift she, uh, it was her cloth that was given to uh, home economics here at Iowa State. I was reading also uh, an article written by Lerner, a historian and historian, and she makes a distinction between women's rights movements and the general feminist movement. Now I know some of my friends um, seem to avoid the word feminine maybe associating it with, associating it with uh, effeminate. <laughs> but um, she makes this distinction that the women's rights movement in the early days uh, concentrated on legal rights and in the early days the ballot, the right to vote, uh, while American feminism embraces all aspects of emancipation of American women. That is the struggle designed to elevate their status socially, politically, economically, and psychologically in terms of self-concept, self-respect. And that the women's rights movement is more narrowly defined to winning legal rights. Historians have asked and criticized these early people in what we might call phase one of the feminist movement for merely working for the right to vote and wondered you know, why this particular emphasis and why they did not neglect other, why they did neglect other reforms. And a number of uh, explanations have been given such as that um, these suffragettes, suffragists um, accepted Victorian morality, etc. But Lerner believes that, that a more logical explanation of this is that at that time they were really just reflecting the mainstream of America because other groups were concerned with legal and constitutional reform rather than other kinds of changes. For example, voting rights had just been extended to property, propertyless white males at the time that the um, suffragists were trying to get the women's vote. Now, now we have phase two of the American femi um, feminine, my goodness, women's right movement is easier to say. <laughs> um, and all of you are probably 
very much aware of how much is appearing in the press about women in these days. Now, as examples, and I think this is typical of some of the kinds of things that uh, happen most every day, July 4th, the Des Moines Register editorial page, there was an editorial, Women Effective for Peace. This dealt with the contributions that some of the Catholic women in Northern Ireland have made in trying to um, move to a point where the IRA would accept not being so belligerent. And um, the, the goal of not peace, but at least calming down a bit, uh, has apparently been accomplished largely due to this group of women who were quite aggressive in uh, trying to stand up for their belief that all of this uh, belligerent battling with the two different sides and with the British um, police was of little avail and should be stopped. Then on Wednesday, July 5th, two examples from the Des Moines Register. On page four, maybe you noticed <coughs> this contribution <coughs> of um, Patricia Roberts Harris, a black woman <coughs> lawyer who um, has been in a chairman of the Democratic Party's <coughs> Credentials Committee sessions. Um, the article says that, <coughs> goodness, last October, that her opponents thought that her selection would lead to chaos and possibly split the convention. But Tuesday, after nearing the end of nine grueling days of challenges before the 150-member committee she heads, she received two standing ovations, a bouquet of flowers. Now, I guess maybe they wouldn't have given a man a bouquet of flowers, or would they? <laughs> and a resolution praising her unwavering fairness and firmness and quiet good humor. And she, well, she won the acclaim of both the people who supported her being chairman and those who did not. I'll be non-political and not name names. <laughs> but um, she was describing that she believed, she was convinced that even the most difficult and controversial challenges could be resolved with clear rules, fair application of them, and firmness in debating the issues. And that she believed that during this week of effort, they had been able to resolve issues, I guess we should say at least temporarily <laughs> until the convention, without coming to verbal or physical blows. We can disagree without giving any quarter in an orderly fashion. Now, you know, for a woman to be talking so aggressively about intellectual debate is not the usual stereotype of functions of a woman uh, in our society, but more and more women are giving evidence of being able to operate successfully in a variety of fields. Well, before we get too pleased that progress really is being made in terms of women um, being accepted and seen for whatever um, any individual is worthy of being accepted and seen for, then we turn to the sports page of the same paper yesterday morning. Now, in the defense of uh, the Des Moines Register, this, this morning's headlines, uh, what is her name, Gula Gong or something like this, from Australia, right, um, who defeated Chris Everett from the United States in the 
semifinals at the Wimbledon tennis tournaments. But the headline here says, Smith, Lone U.S. Wimbledon Hope. And the lead article here is about the fact that the other <laughs> U.S. men have been defeated. Now, it really should say Smith, Lone, U.S. Wimbledon, man's, you know, hope for men. <laughs> the other story is about Chris Everett, who lost in the, in the uh, match yesterday, a girl from the United States. But this headline writer wouldn't bat an eye about talking about the lone hope for men, but I bet this morning's headline, and I can't remember, would be about the women's title. You don't have to call it a man's title, you know. <laughs> but Smith is the lone U.S. hope when there were still at least two U.S. women in the matches for women at the same time. And it seems to me that this is typical of what happens not deliberately, I suppose if much um, discrimination were deliberate, you could fight it more openly and be more successful. But unwittingly, um, the human mind is such that we do a lot of things to operate more efficiently. You know, as we drive the car, we really don't think through every little movement that we make in turning the corner or uh, stopping at a light. Much of this is sort of automatic and we're more efficient because of this. But much of what is said and written and uh, many of the decisions that are made that relate to women are automatic too, but automatically accepting assumptions that would be true about separation of roles of men and women uh, well, a couple of generations ago, but are not true now in terms of um, how we can function most effectively in society, in the home. Now, I thought uh, some of you may be more knowledgeable than I about some of the legal developments, but just briefly, and I'm thinking mostly here of developments that relate to women in education or education for women, since we're operating in an educational setting. But there certainly have been a number of legal steps, legal acts or executive orders and such that affect where we are now in terms of um, freedom of men and women to um, make a variety of kinds of choices. For example, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 and its 1966 amendments, the Federal Equal Pay Act of 1963, the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, sex discrimination guidelines issued by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and we could go on with uh, a number of others. I will mention particularly some details about a few. In um, March, the, near the end of March this year, both houses of Congress and a uh, past and the president signed a law bringing educational institutions under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Until that time, educational institutions and I believe state and local governments were exempt from the requirements of the Civil Rights Act. And here, this includes that it is illegal to discriminate against employees or applicants for employment because of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And not only discrimination 
of employees, but in hiring practices and um, conditions under which the employees work, such as compensation, conditions, privileges of employment, and so on. And the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission now has the right for the first time to sue an employer who, uh, upon investigation they believe, has been discriminating against employees for any of these reasons. They are required at first to try to work out conciliation. But if that is not successful, then they have the right to sue. Formerly, they could only, um, you know, talk with <laughs> and attempt to work out something that would be satisfactory. They have more power now to, um, you know, take action <laughs> in terms of suits. Then, the Equal Rights Amendment. And at least one of our senators um, had quite a bit in the paper because of some of the steps he took in trying to amend this Equal Rights Amendment to protect women. But um, the Equal Rights Amendment is extremely short. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Now, this was passed in Congress. There had been efforts for a number of years to get this passed. It did pass. It must be ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures. At the time Iowa passed it, and they did, um, you know, at one time we thought we were number three, but I think we ended up, what, fifth or something among the states. At the American Home Economics Association last week, I believe I heard someone who should be informed say that now about 30 states have ratified it. That may not be exactly right, but there's still a ways to go. Although, um, I don't know, how many of you are from other states besides Iowa? A few. Um, hopefully, people will really push this so that uh, a sufficient number of state legislatures will ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Then some other steps that have been taken, and I guess all of this just shows that certainly from a variety of sources, people are getting lots of support for providing for equality for all, uh, for minority groups and for women. Women are not a minority, but they often act like one. <laughs> uh, in December 1971, last December, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance, U.S. Department of Labor, issued some regulations requiring that each contractor, each institution or agency that has as much as a $50,000 contract with the U.S. government in some form and employs as many uh, as 50 employees would, by early April of 72, or within a certain period after getting a new contract with the government. Here at Iowa State, it would be by early April, each institution would need to develop and file an affirmative action plan or affirmative action program, which would show the goals include, among other things, the goals that that institution would work toward and some timetables for accomplishing these goals in good faith to bring about equality of treatment for all employees. There was in, um, oh, I don't have the date, but late May or early June, a clarification 
from um, the chief civil rights officer in HEW. Uh, even though this regulation came from the Department of Labor, it really affects all. And the statement from HEW concerns this uh, requirement for affirmative action programs. And they were trying to make a distinction here and clarify that they were not going to require quotas because, as they said, many of them in the Civil Rights Office had been the victim of quotas, <laughs> in a sense, uh, but rather goals so that the University Committee on Women here, for example, has this in mind and one of our assignments is to make recommendations and these may very well be goals that, uh, that we think Iowa State University should work toward in bringing about greater well, I guess equality is not one of those things that you can have in degrees, is it? <laughs> Bringing about absolute, maybe? Approaching absolute equality <laughs> for um, men and women here at Iowa State University. Uh, goals, they say, signify a different concept from quotas and a different employment practice. If, for example, an institution has been deficient in training, upgrading, promoting, or otherwise treating employees without regard to race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, goals are projected levels of hiring that say what an employer can do if he really tries. By establishing goals, the employer commits himself to a good faith effort that is most likely to produce results. Now, that regulation and the HEW explanation, the HEW explanation in April, the regulation in December, uh, was followed by another one from the Department of Labor in April <clears throat> on guidelines on discrimination because of sex. And because they very specifically point out some of the things that they consider discrimination, and these are kinds of behaviors that are um, have been observed in a variety of institutions. I think I'll um, refer to some of these. This is a further clarification of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. I think I'm right. Yes. Now, they say that that bona fide occupational qualification exception as to sex, that is, there are some occupations where it's legitimate to say that a man or a woman is needed for this, but they're saying that such descriptions should be very narrowly uh, defined, that is, the job should be nar narrowly defined in terms of uh, excluding one sex or the other from a job and that the following situations do not warrant application for a bona fide justification for saying one sex or the other <coughs> is needed. <coughs> for example, the refusal to hire a woman because of her sex based on assumptions of the comparative employment characteristics of women in general. For example, the assumption that the turnover rate among women is higher than among men. This is not a legitimate reason. Actually, any justification for that feeling about women for years has been only associated with women who have very young children. But business and industry, and education maybe, has tended to assume that because there may be greater absenteeism or greater turnover for this young woman with very young children, they've tended to associate this with all women, when actually some of the older age groups of women have um, longer, less absenteeism and um, equal tenure <laughs> in the same position. 
to men. Now another um, unacceptable reason, stereotype characterizations of the sexes, and this works either way. For example, that men are less capable of assembling intricate equipment. This is not a reason for excluding men or insisting on women that women are less capable of aggressive salesmanship. This is not acceptable. Requires that individuals be considered on the basis of individual capacities and not on the basis of any characteristics generally attributed to the group. Because I would expect there would be greater variation, this is I, not this, <laughs> uh, among women or among men on almost any ability related to employment that one could identify, then there would be, you know, the variation within a group would be greater than the difference between the groups, I expect. The, um, the only example they give for justifiably asking for a man or a woman is in the case of an actor or an actress. <laughs> um, maybe there are some others. Then they also go uh, into a number of kinds of state regulations that they consider invalid that are discriminatory either in relation uh, against the man or the woman. Now, um, women have some responsibilities here certainly and if we're looking at education we might look at the proportion of women in higher education in relation, uh, now in relation to some earlier times. For example, if we look at just uh, numbers, in 1930, women college students, there were 481,000, so 480,000. 1970, three million five hundred seven thousand almost eight times as many women in college 1930 1970 40 year difference or the women receiving degrees in third in 1930 over 55,000 in 1970 433,000 it's almost eight times as many but now when you look at the proportion in terms of proportion of the total number, how many are men and how many are women, women have lost ground. Um, in 1930, 44 percent of college enrollment was women, 44 percent. In 1970, 41, down 3 percent. Actually, it had been lower and then has been gradually coming back up in, since the 1950s. Bachelor's degrees, 1930, 40 percent, 70, 42 percent, up a little. Um, doctorates, 15 percent in 1930 were women, 13 percent in 1970. I was interested that in 1899, the 53% of the degrees granted were to women, 53%. 1970, you see, it was 41. Um, and various studies give different figures here. 75 to 90% of the high school graduates who are qualified to go on to college, 75 to 90% of those that are qualified but don't go on are women. In other words, as has been true for some time, more women, more, bo more girls than boys in proportions finish high school. But you reverse this immediately in the United States when you talk about higher education and even more so when you talk about going on for graduate degrees, the proportions of women of the total go down. Uh, another kind of characteristic, and I'm certainly not going to be able to say all that I want to say, 
that um, relates to education of women is how can education be adjusted to provide for the needs of women who have been at home, probably, but have been homemakers for quite a period of time, want to come back into work or want to return to education. And some of the characteristics that education needs to consider, and we have considered some of these at Iowa State, but not all, uh, in order to serve more mature students, this is um, more true, this need for serving more students for men is now more true than it used to be <laughs> in that the pattern of starting one's education and going straight on and straight through the profession is broken for men as well as women for somewhat different reasons. But older women need, for example, enrollment on a part-time basis, flexible course hours, short-term courses, counseling services for adult women, financial aid for part-time study, most financial aid is for full-time students, limited residence requirements, etc. There are a number of kinds of uh, adjustments in education that can help serve mature women more effectively than we have been doing. Um, some of the problems that are associated with women in higher education, let's say faculty now, as a group, in general, they are paid less. At least these are kinds of criticisms that our University Committee on Women is aware of in terms of what's been said about women in general in higher education, and we are attempting to see if there is any justification for saying these problems exist here and that something should be done about them. Paid less, carry out the less desirable teaching assignments, occupy the lower ranks, first to be laid off in hard times, and rarely move into important administrative positions. And even women students are suspicious of them, <laughs> some authors say. Ruth Eckert from the University of Minnesota suggests that women are actually more disadvantaged now than they were in the mid-1950s, whether this is judged by percentage on college staffs, academic rank, or scholarly preparation and productivity. Um, I don't know whether this person's name is pronounced Dinerman or Dinnerman, writing in the Journal of Higher Education, brought out some characteristics that critics of women in higher education um, accuse women of having. Lacking credibility, originality, and productivity. And um, frankly, you know, as a person concerned with research, I'm apologizing for not having read yet the primary source here, the study by Jesse Bernard on academic women, and this is a source being quoted, but in a supposedly in this study, it was shown that students found a woman faculty member less convincing, less authoritative, less valid than they found the man faculty member when the two faculty were presenting exactly the same material. This credibility gap is especially wide when new concepts are being taught, that is, ideas lacking the weight of traditional definitive bodies of knowledge. Now, the feeling is that this is really not do at all to any characteristics of the woman faculty member or the man faculty member. They are equally intellectually able. <laughs> they were presenting exactly the same information. But rather that this result, it was believed, was a product of what the students have been taught over a lifetime in terms of 
their stereotype of a woman, that a woman wasn't quite, you see, uh, worthy of quite as much trust when it gets to uh, intellectual matters. Uh, rather, the female faculty member is more a listener and absorber of information from others rather than an innovator. Uh, let me explain, I don't believe that's true of women, but these were the reactions. Um, the question of productivity in terms of, let's say, research publications, that's one kind of productivity that is often looked at. One possible explanation, if women have not been as productive, and this is not true of all women, <laughs> But one possible explanation in fields that are predominantly uh, carried on by men is that much learning and stimulation from each other takes part in informal conversations, in getting together in groups on the campus or informal meetings at conventions and so on, and that if there are few women involved and many men, the women may be excluded from, not deliberately, but just from many little informal situations that help, you know, produce opportunities for production and also uh, help produce stimulating ideas. This um, is not true of fields predominantly women, of course, although I think it may be true that some of the fields, such as some of the areas of home economics, and I'm talking about my own field now, that maybe I think in some ways we have some of the characteristics associated with women, in that as a field we may not have been quite as aggressive <laughs> professionally and intellectually as some fields predominantly led by men. I believe this is not true at the present time, but it takes a while for fields to overcome lags in terms of um, production. And here I'm not talking about any one individual, but you know, this <laughs> conglomerate of, of, of a field of endeavor or a discipline. Now, here at Iowa State, there are a few um, facts that you may be interested in. I'm not trying to uh, say that Iowa State is um, perfection or <laughs> full of problems, either one, but here are some of the characteristics. It, Iowa State was coeducational from the day it opened its doors and was, I didn't know this, the first land-grant college to adopt co-education. A woman was among the teachers of the opening class, and there have been women on the faculty ever since. Iowa State has always accepted men and women, undergraduate students and graduate students. You know, our famous ratio, in 1953, this um, was right after the uh, World War II military veterans, well, the numbers here would have, would have uh, decreased immensely by 1953. The enrollment here was 7,780 students, 80% men. I didn't realize it was eight to one. <laughs> that was 1953. At that time, 90% men in the graduate college. So 80% undergraduate, 90% graduate. In 1970, with 19,620 students, the percentage of men was down from the 80%. You see, this, this is 17 years later, 53 to 70, down from 80% to 68%, just over two-thirds men. The graduate college was down from 90% to 80%. Here again, illustrating that even now, you see, women are not in numbers 
in graduate education to the extent that they are in undergraduate education. And frankly, how can you expect numbers of university presidents <laughs> who are women and numbers of people in top positions, large numbers of women, until we have a higher proportion of women going on to advanced uh, education? Now, I, uh, when they looked at the admissions in 1970 here at Iowa State in graduate college, there were 17% of the applicants were women. Of those admitted, 21% were women. And of those enrolled, 27% were women. Of those that applied for admission, 48% of the men were admitted or accepted and 51% of the women. So that's really not very different, but it happens a little bit higher percentage of the women were accepted than the men. But you know, that little difference, you, you could say essentially the same. Of those admitted, and I'd be interested in knowing why this is, you're admitted as a graduate student, but do you come? <laughs> 64% of the men did come, of those admitted, 64%. 90% of the women did. Um, maybe the men, you know, shop around more, um, apply more different places, and then have more um, choices to make at the end, I'm not sure. But 90% of the women who were admitted did come. This may be associated with differences in fields, however, too. Um, now, there are a number, there are, <clears throat> I'm going to skip over a number of things here, but there are a number of organized efforts underway to try to bring about improved equality, to bring about equality for women and men. Um, various task forces, from different organizations and societies. Many of the professional societies um, have caucuses for women or committee W's, <laughs> committees on women. Um, the um, AAUW develops standards that they distributed to various um, institutions of higher education, making uh, recommendations for action that could be taken to improve the situation. Um, I've been talking predominantly about higher education and certainly preschool, elementary, secondary is, is um, the contributions there are crucial because the uh, concepts that boys and girls are getting of themselves and of roles of men and women are, are being developed at that time. Mary S. Calderon, I think it's pronounced, um, has written that today a female can do almost anything she wants to do without damaging her own sense of femininity. I would say that this varies with different cultural groups, that this would not be 100% true throughout Iowa, throughout the United States. But this is more nearly true than it was a few years ago. Limits imposed on her are apt to be pragmatic rather than social, in the sense that some women can't do some things men can do, but neither can all men do everything that some men can do. The real factor, she says, that's being obscured by the clamor of the women's lib movement is that women are far more emancipated than are men. She says the one bright spot is that men do appear to be shaking off a number of their inhibiting patterns without any sense of loss of masculinity, signaled at first primarily by the successive steps of long hair, frilled shirts, bead necklaces, bright colors in dress. This change has moved from apparent to real as men have become far more fluid and adaptable in what they feel free to do in various roles that used to be thought of 
as exclusively female. Still Mary Calderon, an MD, we are moving toward the Swedish pattern in which no role is looked upon as belittling to either man or woman unless he or she feels it to be. The Swedish pattern says, in effect, we are men and women, but first we are human beings and have human roles to play as human beings rather than as males or females. I think society should welcome the achievement of such attitudes for they would nullify the effects of militancy and hostility between the sexes. Then in another article by Gardner, not, I better say Joanne Evans Gardner, she gave uh, this little story which um, I'd like to share with you. A father and son were involved in a serious automobile accident. The father was killed. The son was taken to a nearby hospital in critical condition. When he was wheeled into, the sur into surgery, the surgeon looked at the desperately wounded boy and exclaimed, oh my God, that's my son. The question is, how could all of this be true? And if you were even pausing for a moment on how this can be true, and frankly, I did pause for a moment when I first read this, then you and I are accepting just a little bit <laughs> the sex stereotype, you see, that a surgeon would not have been his mother, but the surgeon was his mother. And I, I thought, um, that because this illustrates the kind of hidden <laughs> Um, thoughts and attitudes that we have that I would stop with this because I think one of, one of the things we have to work on, each of us, is our own attitudes and then helping others at least become aware and then to change their behavior about attitudes that they don't even know they have <laughs> about appropriate roles for either men or women. I think men should be freed to be individuals and women should be freed to be individuals not freed without accepting um, expectations that make a society function um, happily but men should be free to enjoy for example being a parent just as much as, as a woman enjoys being a parent or any other roles that um, we are given the opportunity of assuming. Well, I've, I've talked too long. Now, if, if you can stay a little while longer and wish to ask questions, I'll be glad to, or if you want to discuss anything with each other. Yes? Not this evening, no. There are so many things to talk about in relation to status of women that my selection may not have been what you hoped it would be. But do you have comments or questions? Yes. I'm sure that, that a quota 
which might would be some number that you were going to do something with, <laughs> a quota would be phrased in numbers, would be easier to see if it had been met. Uh, and it might even, in a sense, be easier to pull some number and try to work and, and say this is what the quota should be. But um, I am most thankful <laughs> that they are urging goals rather than quotas because I'm not sure that any group of people could be knowledgeable enough about all the factors that are going to enter in or that have in the past to be able to predict that any given number is going to really be the best kind of situation, you know, even best for providing equal opportunity. Um, the chief civil rights officer here in talking about um, quotas says quotas are numerical levels of employment that must be met if the employer is not to be found in violation of the law. They are rigid requirements and their effect is to compel employment decisions to fulfill them. Regardless of qualifications, regardless of a good faith effort to fulfill them, and regardless of the availability of capable applicants. You know, once a quota's been set, no matter what the conditions are, that's the quota. While they say that, unlike quotas, goals are not the sole or even the primary measurement of a university's compliance. Good faith efforts remain the standard set by Executive Order 11246. Goals are a barometer of good faith performance. If a university falls short of its goals, then it, that in itself does not result in noncompliance. A good faith effort to achieve those goals remains the test. I suppose if quotas could be treated the same way, you know, and good faith effort to meet quotas um, could be handled the same way maybe, but a quota implies it must be met, a goal, they still, every effort should be made to meet the goal. Then evidences of honest to goodness, good faith effort. Now this is harder, <laughs> harder to prove or prove lacking. But um, if any of the rest of you wish to react, please do. But often, you know, even in uh, making judgments about performance levels of students, often the wisest judgments are not necessarily those that are always quantifiable. <laughs> Now, it seems to me that in many human endeavors, um, we have a tendency to overstate or overact before we get to some kind of stable <laughs> condition that moves us ahead. And um, I would hope that I, I can just only give my own reactions here, not the committee's. Uh, there are a few members of the committee present, just two, I guess. Ann Weir and graduate student in journalism, Anne, <laughs> and Joanne Anderson in the uh, personnel office. Um, I would hope that we would, we would keep constantly in mind that the point here is that students should have an opportunity to um, choose the area that they want to 
major in without restrictions. That is, their choice hopefully will be based upon their potential abilities, their aptitudes, and not just uh, be limited because the student is a man or a woman. Now, in terms of faculty, uh, one way of showing that you believe that women, women are able to perform in a given field is to have women performing <laughs> successfully. Um, so the point to me is that if a girl wants to become an engineer and has the potential ability to do so based on the best <laughs> evidence we can obtain, she should be able to do so. At the same time, if she chooses to some field of home economics, I hope she would be able to choose that. Likewise for the man, either way. Should engineering go out and actively recruit women students? Um, those who would say yes would, would be saying it, I suppose, to say that this is a way of proving that we have confidence in women's abilities and we welcome them as engineers.